So in this part, I'd like to ask you some questions about yourself. Let's start with what you do. Do you work or do you study? Oh, I'm a student. Mm -hmm. And what subject? Uh, I'm studying MSc Marketing. Mm -hmm. And why did you choose that subject? Oh, because uh, analytics is big now. Big data is everywhere. And I had a previous experience in SQL, so I decided to come here and study analytics. Mm -hmm. And what do you hope to do with that degree after you finish? Oh, I hope to work as a data scientist mm -hmm. in the field, yeah. Why? Like I said, like big data is everywhere and I, I really like uh, SQL and data. I like everything about data. Mm -hmm. So this degree uh, gives me the opportunity to study it in more detail than I knew previously. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, it is a good opportunity to start a career in data analytics and data science. Okay, now let's talk about your free time. What do you like to do in your free time? Oh, since the past year I haven't really had too much free time, but usually I just like to read, travel, uh, talk to, like meet my friends, and I also volunteer uh, during the weekends. And do you prefer to spend your free time indoors or outdoors? Uh, depends on the weather. If it's raining, I don't like to go outside, but most of the time, yeah, I would like to go outside mm -hmm. that rather than stay in my room. <laughs> and what did you like to do in your free time when you were a child? Oh, I used to read a lot. Just keep reading books all the time. So I never used to like go out and play much. I used to get scolded a lot by my parents, like go out and play with kids your age, but I always used to stay indoors and read. And what are you going to do in your free time this weekend? Oh, this weekend, like I said, I volunteer. So I volunteer at the Macmillan Cancer Support. So uh, I would be going visiting patients and providing counseling to them. Mm -hmm. Good. So now let's talk about travel. Um, do you like to travel? Yes, I do. Why? <laughs> because I like, uh, like uh, getting to know uh, other countries, their culture, how people live, like what they like stuff like that it's interesting to me mm -hmm. and where is a popular tourist destination in your country oh in my country people mostly like to go to Europe because it's like colder and I come from a very warm country so it's like a pleasant change for them so most of us would like to go to America or anywhere in the Europe mm -hmm. where it's colder mm -hmm. is traveling abroad very popular in your country oh yes it is it is quite popular so people mostly go travel uh, during the summer, but it's always summer in India. So yeah, I think uh, movies have a huge role to play in it because they show all these destinations where there's snow covered mountains and all. And that's very fascinating for us because we don't really get snow, <laughs> at least not where I come from. And where would you like to travel to in the future? Oh, uh, there are still a lot of places in India that I haven't seen. So I might go out there as well. And I like, I really like Bali. So, Bali and Greece, yes. Okay. So I'm going to give you a topic and I'd like to t you to talk about that topic for one to two minutes. You'll have one minute to prepare before we begin and you can make some notes. Do you understand? Yes. Okay, uh, the type of clothing that I like to wear is mostly generally casual, but I wear different types of clothes on different occasions like everyone else I suppose. So uh, like regardless of the weather, in India we have a lot of festivals. So uh, usually I do like to wear casual clothes, but like just a jeans and a t-shirt. But like on occasions, uh, on festive occasions, I wear like traditional Indian clothes. And I get them specifically made because they like you can't you you can't really buy uh, like traditional Indian clothes in the malls and all. But I for personally I I do get them made tailor made for me, and because then you can choose your own style your designs or a lot of like stuff like that. So yeah, um, when when you go to a temple I I wear like uh, pure simple clothes because that is the tradition. Um, so that 
that makes me feel like really peaceful and calm because most of the time you wear like simple clothing when you go to a temple so it makes me feel calm when i wear those clothes and during festivals when i wear like those traditional indian clothes uh, it makes me happy because it's uh, like a festival i've been celebrating since i was a kid so during diwali and holi and all uh yes in holi i wear like everyone wears white clothes because they throw colors on you so it, you get like you go out with a white cloth and then when you come back it's like all colorful so different clothes for different occasions as it was here i have been wearing a lot of warm clothes and that makes me feel really really warm yeah and uh, i i buy clothes from from different uh, stores i suppose depending on what kind of clothes i want and um uh, <laughs> So yeah, and uh, uh, when I go for an interview, I I mostly dress in formals. So that makes me feel very confident, <laughs> and and that I'm prepared. Excellent. Okay. Good. Okay, so I'll take this off you, please. Excellent. All right. So we've been talking about clothing, and now I'd like to talk about designer clothes. So, are designer clothes popular in your country these days? Oh uh, yes, I I think so. Yeah. They are quite popular. It depends on like uh, the person actually. Uh, like people, uh, designer clothes are usually usually very expensive. So only a people of certain social, uh, I mean, socioeconomic class can buy those clothes. So they are popular in certain segments of the society. Yes. And why do you think people buy designer clothes? Oh, I think because it it has a social status attached to it. So when you are buying like when you're wearing a specific label the people recognize it and then it shows like what kind of class you belong to and and it is a huge thing in india i think so i think it, it it's because of that it shows like you are from a different class of society and it shows your your affluence i think you can flaunt your affluence that way mm-hmm. maybe that so now let's talk about working clothes do you think you can judge someone based on the kind of clothes they are wearing at work? I personally don't, but I think there is a certain image attached to what you're wearing and people build up perspectives about how one how someone is based on what they're wearing, I think. But personally I don't. And should people be forced to wear certain clothes in work? Uh, well, they shouldn't be forced, but I think uh, ever since like we were young, we are told to wear certain clothes in certain settings because it's appropriate. So in schools, we wear uniforms and we are trained that way. When we go to a temple, we have a certain set of clothes. When we have festivals, we have a certain set of clothes. So I think when we are trained to dress in a certain way in a certain setting, uh, you get used to it. So I don't think it's a, it's a, like people are forcing you to wear uh, like formal clothes in an office setting, but oh, <laughs> it's, it's a tricky one. Um, well, I don't think it, someone should be forced, but as individuals, we should be uh, aware enough of what not to wear in an official setting. So we should make that decision by ourselves. So you don't feel like you're forced to do it. Yeah. And how have work clothes changed in the last couple of decades? Uh, I think uh, it's, it has become less formal now in, in a lot of settings. Like I think companies like Google have made it really uh, popular to wear like engineers that are like smartest of people. They just go to office wearing cla- casual clothes, They're just in a t-shirt and jeans, which is very casual. And uh, they, they lay more importance on, on your work ethic, like how, how you work and how, you co- how much you contribute rather than what you wear. So that is really a refreshing change, I think. So it doesn't, it shouldn't matter what you wear, but like how you work and how much you contribute. So I think times are changing and people are really getting more relaxed about what you wear. Okay, that's the end of the <laughs> test. Well done. Thank you. So the speaking test has four criteria. So pronunciation is number one. Then we have lexical resource, which is just another way of saying vocabulary. And then we have grammatical range and accuracy, so let's just call that grammar. And then we have fluency and coherence. Okay, 
So let's start off with pronunciation. So I could understand 100% of what you were saying, uh, which is very, very important. If the examiner couldn't understand 100% of what you were saying, then they probably would give you a, a, at least a six or below for pronunciation, but I could understand 100% of what you were saying. Um, you do have a tiny little bit of, we call accent interference, mm -hmm. Um, but that didn't stop me actually um, understanding what you said at, at any time. It was very, very easy to, to understand what you were saying. Now, we'd also think about higher level pronunciation features, things like intonation, sentence stress, word stress, connected speech, and you were actually at a very high level in terms of uh, the higher level pronunciation features. Um, so for pronunciation, I would give you a band eight because I can understand 100% of what you're saying without any effort whatsoever, and you have a very um, strong uh, use of those higher level um, pronunciation features. In terms of vocabulary, um, your accuracy is very, very good. Um, you rarely uh, slip up in terms of the, your accuracy for vocabulary, and your range is also very, very good. Um, you have some uh, topic-specific words for nearly everything that I ask you for. You're not searching for vocabulary. You, you, know, you can access the vocabulary very, very easily and use that very, very well. I think for you, um, if you were to, to, to do the IELTS test again, um, I would encourage you during your preparation to take some, some more chances with vocabulary and maybe show how broad your vocabulary actually is because I think your vocabulary is much, much broader than what you actually uh, showed there today. Um, but we didn't give you any coaching or anything like that before uh, we did this. But next time you, I would uh, um, just try and during your preparation to take some more chances but in the real test um, you use the 100% rule. Only use uh, vocabulary that you're 100% sure about. And grammar, you had a couple of very small slips, but the vast majority of your grammar was 100% accurate. Um, nearly all error-free sentences. You used a wide range of structures, complex sentences, simple sentences. You had no problem with tenses, so I asked you about the past, the present, the future. I asked you how things have changed since, you know, how have they changed over the last few decades. You had no uh, problem with any of those tenses. So your grammar is probably your strongest point. I have no worries really with your grammar. You had a couple of little small problems, um, but that is totally natural. Even native speakers have little slips. Um, so for your grammar, I would give you a band eight as well. And for your vocabulary, I would also give you a band eight. But uh, that would be something that I would, if you did were to do the test today immediately, um, you, you m might get a seven for vocabulary if you didn't show the range of vocabulary that you're capable of. So if you were to do the test tomorrow, I would say, you know, just use some more advanced adjectives and, and nouns and, and, and show how good your vocabulary actually is. Your fluency is also very, very good. You don't have any, you don't speak with any noticeable effort. So you don't have to think about the grammar or the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. you're, linguistically, you're very advanced. So you don't, you're, that doesn't affect your fluency. Um, and you're able to, to speak without, without much effort at all. Um, however, the one thing that um, I would say is your, um, not your weakness, but uh, this is something that many sh advanced students like you are not aware of is that um, you need to develop your answers as much as you can um, espe especially for part three so part one they're just normal everyday questions about yourself but you were giving sometimes one word or just oh, a few yeah. word answers so I often had to say like why is this so I mm -hmm. said um, what are you studying and you just said I'm studying this yeah. uh, and I, why do you like that so if we were having a normal conversation no problem because that is that's totally normal to say that but remember you're in a test and the examiner has to judge your pronunciation your vocabulary your grammar your fluency so just one word answers they don't they don't have enough data <laughs> to, to yeah. go on really they teach uh, us differently in india then hmm? they, teach they teach you differently yeah, yeah? what do they, they never, say because uh, i have a tendency to like uh, 
just go on until they stop me because that's what uh, I, I saw on YouTube videos. Mm. But then they told me like, just answer the question. Mm. Don't go off on a tangent. Yeah. So, so, so I just stick I th to that. I think that's, that's a few different things. So one, going off on a tangent, yeah. you shouldn't do that because that you're going to lower your score for coherence. And um, because coherence is, d did the answer make sense? Mm -hmm. So if I ask you about clothing and you start to talk about your favorite music, mm -hmm. that, that's a problem. Um, what your Indian teacher uh, was probably referring to might have been that, but it could also be that certain students just talk on and on and on and on as much as possible. And in part one, they, I know this is frustrating advice, but not too short, not too long. So what does that mean? So too long, the problem with that is the examiner has to ask you a range of different questions. So they will keep stopping you. And often students will be like, oh, what did I do? Did I do something wrong? And they will get very flustered. So a good teacher should not tell you, just keep talking on and on and on and on, especially for part one. Um, so a good way to answer part one questions is answer the question and then give a little bit more detail or an example or an explanation, just a little bit more information for the for the examiner to judge your answer on and, and understand your answer fully for that question. So I don't like giving exact sentence number of sentences because then people are thinking about yeah. number of words and number of sentences. But um, you know, for example, um, what do you what do you study in university? I like to study data science or I like to study business because and then explain oh. why you like it or what would you like to do in the future I would like to be a data scientist because I really blah, blah, you know you like mm -hmm. this you like that or I would love to work for Google because my brother works for Google or something mm -hmm. like that you know a real example part two you did very very well in terms of coherence because you spoke for the full two minutes and you you had a little slip at the end but that's no big deal the examiner is not judging you on one little slip they're judging you on your whole performance and you did very very well for part two part three is the part where you really do need to develop your answers because they're part one is just questions about you whereas Part three are more abstract questions mm -hmm. about ideas in general. So I didn't ask you, um, you know, what are your favorite clothes? I asked you, why do people buy designer clothes? Like a more abstract question. Mm -hmm. So that requires you to, um, to answer the question and then develop your answer, provide reasons for your answer, provide explanations. And then you could also develop by giving some examples so one way you could immediately improve your coherence would be to throw in some examples in there so uh, for example um, let me have a look at the question that we asked you let me give you got it here somewhere <clears throat> so the last question was um, how have work clothes changed in the last few decades and you talked about Google and that was really good. You could also maybe talk about um, 20 years ago, what were software development companies or tech companies like? Um, should people be forced to wear certain clothes? You maybe could say, you know, um, someone working as a police officer, oh, yes, anyone. or someone, you know, you're not being judged on the content. Mm -hmm. You're being judged on how you say it. You're, as, as I said, fluency, pronunciation, grammar, vocabulary is not, the content is not important, but coherence is important, developing the answer especially for part three so if you I think if I was to give you any advice that would be the main thing to work on would be the coherence part one give a little bit more uh, more information and then part three fully um, explain it give some examples and you can also um, <clears throat> answer them by saying well some people would think yes people should wear be forced to wear clothes and this is why they would think this and here's an example of this for example, police, whereas other people who work in the tech industry would say, absolutely not, you can wear anything you want. But I think personally, this, yeah. you know, so, you're do so you can really develop it by looking at things from different angles. Yeah. And, 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 but the, the difficult things for most students are pronunciation, um, grammar and vocabulary. You don't have any real issues with those whatsoever. They take a very long time to improve. Uh, fluency, can take a long time to improve, no problems there. Coherence, you can improve it in a day. So you would be, uh, I think that you could do even better than 
the last time you did the test, which you got at band eight, mm -hmm. I think with a little bit of practice, you could do even better. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Mm. Well done.